Thank you very much and welcome back to the, the final afternoon of our ASPE conference for 2016 looking at the Defence White Paper. I'm Jacinta Carroll, I'm Head of the Counterterrorism Policy Centre at ASPE and it's my pleasure to welcome a very esteemed panel to discuss the realities of regional engagement. We've been taken on quite, quite a whirlwind tour over the last day and a half of an extraordinarily complex environment that we live in uh, and operate in and are planning for in the Asia Pacific region. We've also touched upon, and we might do this a little bit more here, on some of the strategic shocks and surprises that uh, are hitting various parts of the world and for which we in the defence sector are also trying to plan for so that we can ensure that we're assisting in the most able way. Joining me today, I'd, I'd like to introduce um, from my left, the Honourable David Feeney, Member of Parliament. Uh, David is the Member for Batman in Melbourne and is the Assistant Shadow Minister for Defence, Justice, Veterans Affairs and the Centenary of Anzac, so has quite, quite a handful of, of work on his plate. David was previously a Senator and some of you in the audience from the Australian Defence side would remember him from his involvement in various Defence, uh, various Senate committees including, of course, the Defence, Foreign Affairs and Trade Committee. Uh, he has also previously served uh, in the Labor government as Parliamentary Secretary for Defence. So from his background, and, and for many of you who know David, he has a long-standing, keen and knowledgeable interest in defence, uh, also more broadly in international relations and security. And as we'll see today, uh, is, has a very uh, inquisitive uh, approach and a passion for this topic. Uh, we also have Alan Beam, who needs no introduction to, to most of the audience, nationally and internationally. Alan, of course, uh, started his career as a diplomat, uh, but is best known for reshaping the way Australia's Defence Department policy areas worked and brought to it um, considerable thought and uh, considerable expertise and process in, the t in the terms of strategic thinking. Alan, of course, served as First Assistant Secretary heading International Policy and Strategic Policy Divisions. He's also served across a variety of other central agencies, including, uh, of course, Foreign Affairs, also our Prime Minister and Cabinet Departments, the Attorney Generals, and recently being Chief of Staff to Greg Combe when he was the Minister for Defence Materiel. Uh, he is enthusiastic, clear thinking, erudite, uh, and a great published author. We welcome Alan here and um, you'll be in for a treat. Uh, also, we'd love to welcome to Australia Major General Stephen Rudder, who's currently serving as Director of Strategic Planning and Policy, or for, for, for military amongst us, uh, the J5 at Pacific Command uh, in Hawaii. General Rudder has a very extensive uh, uh, career and biography, as you would imagine, in this senior position. Uh, he's most recently been Commanding General of the 1st Marine uh, Aircraft Wing and has an extensive background as a naval aviator, um, including an instructor, uh, has served at the tactical, operational and strategic levels of command, uh, including serving with CENTCOM, working in the Office of the Secretary of Defence, uh, deploying to, uh, across the Middle East area of operations on a variety of, of operations. Uh, he is a graduate of the War College and is a very highly decorated officer. Um, for, the, for the policy officer, officers amongst us, um, uh, including myself, my heart quickened seeing, seeing that uh, General Rudder had served with uh, Andy Marshall as his, as his military advisor during part of uh, Mr Marshall's 40 plus years as Director of the Office of Net Assessments in the Office of Secretary of Defence. And, uh, and you would of course be aware that Donald Rumsfeld, um, Paul Wolfowitz and others have also served as, as protégés to Mr Marshall. So that's a good one for the uh, for afternoon tea discussions, I would suggest. Uh, your program shows um, Mr Hideake Watanabe from uh, the, the uh, Japanese Ministry of Defence visiting. Um, however, unfortunately, due to urgent commitments uh, that have that have popped up in Japan, um, Mr Watanabe is unfortunately unable to attend and sends his apologies. Uh, very fortunately for us, he also sent at very short notice, and we thank you very much for this. Uh, his deputy, Mr Masaki Ishikawa. Uh, Mr Ishikawa is the Assistant Commissioner of the Acquisition Technology and Logistics Agency headed by Mr Watanabe in the Japanese Ministry of Defence. 
And in this capacity, absolutely relevant to everything we're doing here, he's responsible for all policy planning uh, in the agency. Mr Ishikawa has an extensive career in planning uh, and, in, and uh, in industry and trade portfolios and has previously served at the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry. He was Director General Trade Control Department from 2012 to 2013 and Deputy Director General Commerce and Information Policy Bureau in 2013-2015. He's also served in Singapore at the Japan External Trade Organisation and we welcome you very much here and note that you're on a very busy schedule flying to and from Australia and, and Japan. So now to our topic. I think the best way to, to segue into this is to reflect on the uh, masterclass in regional engagement that we heard from um, SBY earlier today. Some issues of concern that he noted were that the extraordinary military modernisation we're experiencing in our region is not accompanied by the rise of strategic trust. Indeed, he said it is being accompanied by a decline of strategic trust. We've had mapped out for us over the past couple of days uh, many of the, the challenges, the big power movements dominating what is happening in our area, and also those that come from other sources, such as the, the spread of violent extremism and radicalisation, uh, and other pieces, such as natu natural disasters. As we've tracked in terms of capability what Australia's aspirations are and how we might do this, we would ask our panel now to help us navigate this very tricky region that we live in and operate in uh, and map how our partnerships might, might help there and where the opportunities might lie in how we manage to build that form of trust and achieve the outcomes that we've planned for in the white paper. So I'll ask you first to welcome our esteemed panel and then I'll ask David to make some remarks. Uh, well, thank you very much, and can I uh, begin by thanking ASPE very much for the invitation and the opportunity to speak to you today, and indeed congratulate ASPE on what has been such a successful conference. Uh, this is a topic dear to my heart, and I guess my ambition is to uh, try and uh, say some things in the next seven or eight minutes that provoke some conversation and some questions. The Defence White Paper, of course, um, ha describes Australia's commitment to uh, an international uh, rules-based uh, system, uh, a system that is uh, commensurate with our role as a medium power uh, and consistent with uh, our interest as a uh, maritime trading nation and consistent with our values as a democracy, wanting to promote those values uh, globally. And of course, we have to play our part around the world in that task. But there is one particular part of the world where we have to do much more than that. Uh, there is one particular part of the world where Australia is not only tasked with being a contributor, but indeed is looked to as a leader. Uh, and that is certainly true of our friends and our allies who, when it comes to the South Pacific, um, look for Australian leadership and Australian guidance. It's an area of particular importance to us uh, for that reason as well as many others. Uh, and so I guess one of the things I really wanted to highlight was the South Pacific. The South Pacific uh, has a number of challenges uh, that are direct as well as uh, unfolding. Uh, if one looks at the Millennium Development Goals, you can see that a lot of the Pacific Island countries that populate the South Pacific are facing very serious challenges in terms of their environment, in terms of their population and population growth, uh, their economies and their futures as nations. Uh, and added to that, of course, has been uh, varying degrees of uh, governance and political success. Uh, and now, of course, there are challenges in the defence sphere for Australia. Australia can no longer be assured of being the defence partner of choice in the, South, uh, in the Pacific Island countries. Uh, and this uh, truth has been underlined in recent times by uh, Fiji and Fiji's Look North policy. Uh, we saw recently on the eve of tropical cyclone Winston, uh, Fiji take receipt, for instance, of some $19 million worth of weapons from Russia. Uh, we've seen uh, the People's Liberation Army Navy um, undertake uh, in increasing uh, efforts in terms of visiting uh, ports, uh, visiting uh, East Timor most recently. Uh, and so there are a range of challenges for us across the region. 
There was an effort, I remember, when we were in government where Russia encouraged a number of Pacific Island countries to recognise Abkhazia, for instance. And so we saw the obscure diplomatic interests of Russia manifest in uh, a diplomatic effort across the South Pacific. All of these things need to be and must be of interest to us. Uh, unfolding challenges with, of which we must be seized include Bougainville. Uh, of course, Bougainville is scheduled to have uh, a referenda concerning its independence. This will be a matter of great complexity, uh, a, an issue that seizes Papua New Guinea and its body politic. What is Australia doing? How do we respond? Uh, the, that, that's, I guess, typical of the kinds of issues that are on the near horizon for Australia in the South Pacific. In terms of how we respond, we obviously need to have a policy that is uh, well-crafted, which is nuanced, uh, and which encompasses all of Australia's national power, not just defence. Defence is obviously crucial, but there are other uh, agencies of government that must be seized of this too. Uh, one of my pet projects when we were in government was the Pacific Maritime Security Plan. Uh, this is building on the success of the Pacific Patrol Boat Program, first introduced when Kim Beasley was Defence Minister, which of course uh, places uh, patrol boats in jurisdictions that would otherwise not be able to afford or maintain that capability, together with officers uh, and technical uh, support from the Royal Australian Navy. That was an enormously and remains an enormously successful program uh, in terms of building lasting links with those Pacific Island countries. Uh, I have visited most of the countries in the Pacific Island uh, countries uh, and the presence of those uniformed personnel uh, has great cachet in those countries in both the diplomatic and defence and security spheres. It's something that must keep happening. But it's like all great programs, it must, be, it, it must evolve. There needs to be far greater coordination across the region so that uh, the economic uh, sovereignty of those countries is protected against dangers like IUU fishing uh, and as well as transnational crime. We need uh, a much stronger coordination and surveillance piece to sit alongside uh, that patrol boat piece so that uh, we continue to, um, I guess, make sure that those countries have the capabilities they need and also uh, consolidate our role as their defence and security partner of choice. So too with uh, foreign aid and our support for these countries in their development. Uh, so too for uh, the police. The International Deployment Group of the AFP um, is an enormously successful body that I think we should be using far more. Uh, of course, they demonstrated their capacities in Ramsey. Uh, they dem demonstrated their capacities uh, in Papua New Guinea. Uh, but they need to be used a lot more, and of course, we need to be working collaboratively and constructively with Papua New Guinea and other countries so that we build the policing capabilities of those countries, so critical to their development, so critical to the investment climate uh, of those countries, uh, but also, uh, again, uh, part of the national security architecture that we want to see built across that region. Looking at other parts of our uh, primary operational environment where I think we, uh, as a nation, are undercooked is Antarctica. Uh, I, Antarctica is, of course, uh, an environment where there is uh, a treaty architecture that makes sure that space is, uh, is not militarised, uh, nor is it open to economic exploitation in terms of uh, fossil fuels, gas, oil, so forth. It is acutely in our interest to support that treaty architecture, and we must recognise that that architecture is going to be under increasing strain as we head towards 2048, uh, when it is due for renewal. Above and beyond that strain is the fact that Australia claims 42% of Antarctica uh, but we have not made good that claim in terms of investing in the continent, in terms of bases and capabilities. So the status quo is greatly in our interest, uh, but if we don't invest in that status quo in a very significant way, uh, then in fact we will find ourselves uh, dealing potentially with a uh, southern flank of the nation, uh, which we have long taken for granted is a unmilitarised space, uh, and we should not be able to, we should not take that for granted into the future. The Royal Australian Air Force has recently uh, been flying C-17s into Antarctica and demonstrating uh, that that can be an important part of the logistics network. But we should embrace a vision where Hobart becomes the global capital for supporting 
operations in Antarctica. We should invest in science in Antarctica. We should invest in the air and sea links that sustain Antarctica and in that way make good our claim uh, and make good our commitment to the, to the status quo in Antarctica. We see, for instance, that Russia and China are both growing their presence in Antarctica uh, at, at a very significant rate, uh, and this is not something that we should lose sight of in terms of our own claims to the continent. Uh, so listen, I guess with those hopefully thought-provoking thoughts, uh, I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, David. Look, we, we will go straight to the next speaker, but I can see that we're getting, we are getting into practical options, and there are some great ones. Um, wonderful to hear the South Pacific, and, and I think the first time we've had Antarctica mentioned at a, mm -hmm. at a conference like this for a while. So we might pass now to Alan, please. Thank you, Jacinta. I'd like to begin by um, thanking uh, Peter and, and Anthony and the, the leadership of ASPE for their courage in asking me to come and talk to you about regional realities. Um, and I'm going to start with what I think is the, the greatest obstacle to our ability to achieve anything in the region, uh, and it is ourselves. Now, I will preface my remarks by saying that I'm very glad that um, our colleague, the J5 from SyncPAC's headquarters is here, because I studied at the school of Earl Hailston's diplomacy and Marty Steele, two of his predecessors, who were pretty forthright in their ability to, well, it's most my great heroes, by the way. <laughs> most Marines are, aren't they, in telling, you, <laughs> in telling you which way is up and what you can do with a shovel. <laughs> Our greatest problem in realising anything is ourselves. Um, we are a complacent, um, introspective, self-satisfied, smug country who sits down here and advises everybody else about how to deal with their problems when we're actually not all that smart in dealing with our own. And if you want to have an example of the kind of smugness I'm talking about, we, it was perfectly illustrated before lunch today. Would anybody care to tell me who might be our greatest strategic asset in Indonesia? Obviously. Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono is probably our greatest strategic asset in Indonesia. Yet there was not one member of the government who was here to listen to him. There was no secretary of any department who was here to listen to him. The CDF wasn't here to listen to him, and nor were any of our senior defence leaders. That is what smugness looks like. And it makes me cross, because there are many of us in this room who are not smug. But yet, we live in an environment where it's, it's pernicious, it's corrosive, and it gets us all the time. We create a sense of otherness all the time, but without ever wanting to know who the other is. So they're just out there. We look at the region. Well, we don't, actually. We fly over it. We all want to go somewhere else. We fly over it to go to Europe, because that's where some of us might take our holidays. Most Australians think that Bali is an independent country. <laughs> and, and they fly over Indonesia in order to get somewhere else too, because the holidays are actually cheaper in Vietnam. So, you know, we live like that. I think it is a very great problem that we've got. We are not naturally engaged. And what is more, we are monolingual. Now, I was at a, a conference, not a conference, I was at a meeting yesterday of high-level investors interested in Chinese uh, direct investment into Australia. Of the chief executives of the 15 investment companies, not one could speak Mandarin. It was all done by remote control. We hire people who speak English. And I'm just saying to you that this is pernicious and it acts against us all the time. I call it institutionalised ignorance um, because that's what we like to do. And we all feel comfortable when we institutionalise it. And it's that very comfort which I think erodes our capacity to do anything really significant or meaningful in the region that matters most to us. I'd like to move on to what I think is the second big problem which we've got, is that we don't understand what convergence really is. Now, the word convergence came up a few times this morning, and the word ambiguity also comes up. And I actually think convergence and ambiguity mean exactly the same thing. And I'll tell you why. Because what we are facing, and this was touched upon, to be fair to presenters uh, that I listened to this morning, 
is the convergence of a set of fundamentally wicked problems which generate the greatest ambiguity, strategic ambiguity, that we've ever had to live with in, in Asia. Kim touched upon it, but I just want to pick on just two of them. No, I'll pick on three. I want to pick on climate, and you might expect me to do that, since I did work with a government which enacted a climate policy and a carbon price. Anybody who would like me to distinguish a price from a tax, I'd be very happy to do that for you. Uh, tax is not avoidable, and David will tell you the price is. So we, we transacted that business, but climate and global warming, which is essentially what it is, is a fundamental strategic issue for us in our region. And it's not just about acidification, it's not just about salinity, and it's not just about rising sea levels. It's about how all of those things converge to create problems around food and population that we have no concept about how to deal with. And nor are we seriously talking in our neighbourhood about that. That's a very serious issue. Kim this morning mentioned water. Now, Andy Marshall in the mid-80s did a major study on water looking out half a century and it is all just about to take place. China already controls the headwaters of the four greatest rivers of the world and here I'm not picking on China, I'm just giving you a geographic fact. And as China's availability for potable water shrinks, which it is already, it will have few options but to release other sources of potable water for its own population. And then India will, will, will cause Bangladesh to die of thirst. These are very fundamental problems. And the third I want to touch upon is demography. Today's issue of The Economist has a really sobering essay about um, um, ageing and senile dementia in Japan. You may translate that article in The Economist to all of our economies. It is exactly the same problem. And I don't believe any of us have any idea about how to deal with it. So they're just three converging wicked problems which generate massive ambiguity. The third point I'd like to touch upon is the United States. The United States is the power. But in my view, the United States has not demonstrated over the last decade or so the confidence that you might expect of the United States in being able to deliver the benefits of its own power. I think many of its messages are ambiguous and often the US displays a kind of diffidence which we display. But we display our diffidence because we are, generally speaking, weak. I think the US displays its diffidence because it is uncertain. And an uncertain US is not the kind of US that I want to see active as a critical conditioning element in the strategic development of the Western Pacific. I think the US does need constancy in its policy and its policy must be built not around softness or hardness, but it must be built around smartness. And I think particularly where we heard earlier today from, from Michael, um, capacity building and institutional building, but not just restricted to the military institutions, that is a very, very important part of the strategic unfolding of the United States, in my opinion, and one that requires much more investment. The fourth one I want to touch upon is China. China is an extraordinary country which has an immense capacity to stand on its own foot. Um, it, I mean, the amongst the most gifted people you're going to meet anywhere in the world are our colleagues who work in Beijing. But collectively, they have this a fantastic ability to stand on their own foot. They're doing it in the South China Sea now. We all know what the game's about, and we know that it's ineluctable. But they could do it much more smartly. They could do it in the way that the Americans did it after the Sp their war with Spain. But they're not doing it that way. They're doing it with bluster and sabres. It would be, uh, we can understand where they're wanting to go, but they could so much more ad adeptly draw in the, the, the other regional claimants. And the final point I'd like to make, and on this point I'm actually beholden, Peter, to one of your members, um, Graham DeBell. 
Graham brought back to my attention um, a, a really brilliant remark which was made by Wang Gungwu, um, a very famous Indonesian-born, Malaysian-educated Australian, who pointed out that our greatest strategic asset is, in fact, that we're different. That we have institutions which are strong and robust, that we have a prosperity in a society which is to the benefit of almost all of us, maybe the 53% of youths incarcerated in jails today who are indigenous and not enjoying that as much as they ought to be, but by and large we have a fairly uh, equitable sort of country. But we don't leverage that in our interests. We don't leverage what is our greatest asset. So to conclude, I just want to suggest to you that the biggest problem that we have in realising any ambitions that we might have in the Western Pacific and in our own immediate region is ourselves. I have to say, you've almost left me speechless, but I will just share, there's a few people around the room who'll, who would have experienced what I just did, which was a flashback of about 20 years being a junior policy officer in defence, and I will assure you that Alan challenged us and the seniors of defence in the same way he is today, so he actually did walk the talk. I think there's, there's quite a few um, policy projects you've thrown out there. And I would just note, hopefully for, for General Rudder's um, benefit, that blessedly you put the US in the middle of your challenges so that we're not just throwing it out to our PACOM representative to pick up. Uh, and we will note that, that, that General Rudder will talk to his, um, his particular themes that he would like to discuss now. And we might just bring some of those questions on major powers uh, that, that Alan raised for the, for the Q&A. General Rudder. Yeah, thank you, and I, I've been taking notes, so I have a lot of tasks already to, for me to pursue. And, and the good thing is, um, you know, I've been here meeting with uh, my Australian counterparts uh, all week as part of our bilateral engagement uh, process that we do. We have a, a lengthy process. And I'm here, so for the real hard questions, I, I want to point to the naval officer right here at the second table back, uh, Commodore Ian Middleton, who is actually my, my deputy uh, working in PACOM. So this shows you just one example how uh, embedded uh, uh, we are and uh, we have also have a senior executive uh, down there at PACOM as well as another uh, general officer over at United States Army Pacific. And I actually have a lieutenant colonel, which we, uh, Australian officer, we load down with most of the work uh, in the PACOM J-5. So what I'll do uh, first and foremost, and, and thank you, Peter. Um, I'm a, Peter's a big fan, and he wishes uh, all the best of luck. He, he, we, we at PACOM uh, really relish these opportunities uh, because although I'm going to talk for a few minutes, hopefully not more than a few minutes, uh, we, these types of institutions are where we get ideas, is where we get uh, we have uh, open and frank debate. And in the policy world, uh, debate and ideas are key. You know, you can drive ships, you can fly aircraft, you can maneuver things, but this policy and setting up long-term strategy to think out years, uh, like, uh, you know, uh, it was mentioned a few times here, Andy Marshall uh, was so successful in doing, is really, really hard. And those of you who are in the room that, uh, that help us with that, uh, I, I've got to thank you for that. But we were um, talking, you know, getting briefed over the past few weeks on the, uh, the white paper, you know, what we would consider, I, I would consider really very, very uh, well, uh, well documented uh, uh, effort that uh, hits a lot of great points that really truly hit home uh, with, with PACOM. And I think it's, you know, we looked at the rebalance and first of all, you know, I'm in uniform, but certainly when, when I think about the rebalance, it's not, you know, military seems to be the most visible thing you see. Uh, but along with uh, the U.S. government aspects of that, we will advocate and pull as much as we can and participate and be, be well-versed on the economic rebalance uh, to include things like TPP or the diplomatic rebalance. You know, I, uh, our administration has done a very good job. If you look at some of the defense agreements and agreements and new, and, and, and new open openings of doors uh, that we've seen over the past few years uh, to include historic visits uh, by, by our president, uh, that helps us immensely. You know, having President Obama meet uh, with either a prime minister or a president or him go and visit a country, after that, it's just a, it's a new start 
uh, on life for those of us who, who are looking for this regional gaming opportunity, especially with these heretofore countries that we haven't necessarily uh, been able to you know, advance and mature our relationship. So what the Secretary of Defense said uh, for the military side of is, and I think it's uh, completely appropriate uh, for, for this audience, is you know, first he said we need to you know, reinforce and modernize our alliances. And he, he uses alliances as, as the alliance, these, these strong alliances, but he also includes partnerships, because partners are, are, are critical as well. And I'll talk about that in a little bit and some of the challenges that we have with that. Uh, but also investing in future capabilities. Right? You have to use future capabilities. You have to have a budget that allows you to buy the things you want to buy, and then the budget that allows you to place them where you want to place them. Because sitting in the ports of San Diego and North Carolina or Virginia may not be the best place for a regional engagement aspect. And sailing and flying and putting forces forward in engagement opportunities requires, requires a budget that allows you to do that. Uh, and also, so that's part of that. And so his final thing, what he would say, is adapting our force posture to make sure we are postured in a manner that allows us to do the things we want to do. If you want to, if you want to have exercises, or you want to have small things like uh, subject matter expert visits, or law enforcement, or coast guard, you need to position yourself so you can actually get to the areas that you want to get to and operate in a manner that has persistence to it. Because if you're not there, you're not there. So to be there, uh, you've got to posture yourself accordingly. And I think the other thing he says, which we take to heart, is really regional institutions, supporting regional institutions. And I include kind of the broader aspect is that is ASEAN, and certainly we have the ASEAN Plus, uh, and all those forums provide a framework, a framework for open dialogue and debate. And certainly going along with that is your bilateral and trilateral relationships. So although we talk about these bilateral, how important our bilateral relationships is, you know, what Admiral Harris would tell you is uh, those are good beginnings. Uh, bilateral relationships are important. Our line structure is still strong. Uh, in fact, you know, having served, just recently served in Japan uh, as, a, as in command, which we spent a lot of time in Korea, spent a lot of time with the uh, Force Posture Initiative here that is uh, part of the U.S.-Australian uh, initiative. Um, I, I can't think of, speaking of those three alliances, they, they today, they couldn't be any stronger than they are today, and they keep getting better every time we turn around. And quite honestly, it's evidenced by the dialogue that I experienced today. We can't go without saying that some of the, some of the things that both countries have done, uh, as far as uh, counter-ISIL efforts uh, by Australia, uh, certainly the Force Posture Initiative and all the operations that you do both in the region and uh, in, in the world globally is key. And so the white paper, I think, if you look at going back to the regional engagement piece, it will be very important for all of us, and we certainly applaud that effort. Uh, I have to mention um, here uh, uh, our Japanese counterparts, our Japanese friends. I still have, um, you know, visions of when um, you know, we had that great catastrophe, tsunami catastrophe and the issue with Fukushima, uh, where Marine soldiers, uh, airmen, uh, and, Mar and, 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 uh, were, and sailors uh, got in airplanes, got in ships, and rushed to a scene without any information. And uh, aircraft, then Lieutenant General Gluck, another uh, great uh, hero of, of, of all of ours, uh, had aircraft, Marines and aircraft, uh, flying towards Fukushima uh, before, uh, before we even knew what the situation was. We went there and stayed as, as United States uh, standing side by side uh, next to us. So that, that's just a data point that I have operationally that kind of sets the foundation for this, how strong this alliance is, how strong this alliance is. So this new peace and security uh, legislation is, is, a, is, a, is a wonderful thing. And, and as we look at what that has done with the region, having just come back from Hanoi a few months ago and what Japan has done uh, for Vietnam, the open doors there uh, to, to that uh, country, now we, we are just at the cusp of, of, of not only going from this bilateral alliance piece, but we spend just as much time as the Australia, U.S., Japan trilateral alliance, tri I wouldn't say alliance per definition, but this relationship and what we're doing together, 
and also the great work that Japan and the Republic of Korea have done and the U.S. have done in that trilateral relationship. Those are you know, linchpins, I think, in the region if we talk about how these, this relationship piece. And I don't want to forget about some of the other ones we had. The Philippines are just the beginning uh, of, of where uh, I think things have come there, where we have Japan and Korea both helping uh, build capacity. And as we speak today, uh, on the ground, standing Balakatan exercise, uh, it was shoulder to shoulder, was it what it means. We've got 82 uh, Australian commandos. Uh, we've got Japanese observers. We've got uh, uh, rock, or, uh, uh, Philippine Marines, U.S. Marines, and U.S. soldiers operating together in the Philippines for, for a tremendous exercise uh, called uh, Balakatan. Um, the, the finally, I think if we look at, we talked about trilateral, I'll just mention one quick quadrilateral piece we're trying to get to, currently a trilateral, and that's with India, which is another great focus area of PACOM. And we've made great strides over this past year uh, to really uh, uh, build that relationship, build, I think, the beginning of a long trust uh, foundation. Uh, and, and I think that uh, as we look at a like, simple exercise like Malabar that included both Indian Navy, U.S. Navy, and Japanese Navy operating together, and soon we'd hope to have the Australian Navy together. So all these things are in work for us to do that. But although we love, we cherish our alliances, and I'll also mention uh, Thailand, our longest standing alliance uh, in the region with the US, uh, we also cherish our partnerships too. And the dynamics with establishing partnerships with places like Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia, means that uh, it's, it's a US partnership for different exercises. Uh, but we build upon the entrance points that either Australia or Japan uh, uh, has already provided in some cases, because some, some of us have better entrance points into a particular nation than others. So uh, we are uh, also looking at some of the smaller countries. I think I mentioned Vietnam, but also things like Sri Lanka, right? Sri Lanka, we had our first port visit to Sri Lanka in many, many years. Uh, Myanmar, and watching those elections unfold and being ready to be able to shake hands and, and visit and establish these open dialogues in a bilateral sense first, but also looking at how we can uh, capacity build uh, in, a, in a more open form, a regionally focused piece. All these things take time. Uh, it takes patience. It's something that I think about all the time. We think about these larger alliances, of course, they're important, but they're strong and it's like a, it's like a machine that keeps rolling. Uh, but a lot of times we spend in our circles talking about these other countries and bringing these other countries into this regional fold, part of the, part of the regional institution building that's so, so important uh, for a region that really is economically viable. Uh, it's got great potential. Uh, uh, it's got great potential in all other means as far as medicine, uh, law enforcement, uh, all the things that are most important to that country, in some cases, uh, that we hold important for PACOM is things like HADR. If you're a professional military officer in the Pacific, you will. Uh, you will um, uh, have to respond to a disaster. It's just a matter of time. It's just only a matter of time, and each year we have. Uh, so those things, uh, if nothing else, as far as building a, a, uh, a defense capability, a law enforcement capability, a maritime domain awareness capability, uh, being able to come together in a, uh, a regional format for HADR uh, is critical. And I think we have some work to do on that. I think Nepal, earthquake uh, relief. I think we had Indian, we had China, we had the U.S., and we were kind of, we, were all, we all rushed to, to, to come to the effort uh, of Nepal. I think it was successful in the fact that we were able to provide, you know, uh, assistance, a greatly needed population, uh, but I think the coordination has uh, some work to do, so we, we practice a lot of that. I will uh, kind of back off from there. Um, I think that uh, some of the things we work on uh, most often is these institutions. And I'll, I'll talk about institutions just for a second. Uh, when we talk about military uh, uh, assistance, and many times um, some of the, the hardest thing to do and the most critical thing we do is build a, a military institution uh, that can one, collect information, share information, work together as services, and be able to operate as a, as a combined force. We advocate the joint force, right, for the United States uh, of America, 
and I think Australia and, and, and Japan are in the same light. And but sometimes, you know, some of our biggest challenges uh, for regional engagement are making sure that we have very army-centric uh, countries out there. Uh, they have small navies with a large maritime uh, problem set. Uh, we have small air forces that have a very uh, a large problem set there. Uh, so bringing those institutions together to be able to have a con you know a, kind of a a, a, a a integrated defense uh, posture that uh, we can connect into is sometimes our greatest challenge. We spend a lot of time working and advocating that in joint environment. So with that, I'll step back and, and hand it over to my good friend, Mr. Ishikawa. Yeah, let's just to say thank you. And, um, I think there's a, there a, a beautiful series of anecdotes there describing the problem, and particularly that complexity of moving to very deep, well-established bilateral arrangements, um, sometimes successfully moving into the trilateral, and as we've seen with Admiral Harris's remarks recently, um, perhaps, again, President Uriono's comments about the shared trust not being that high, the difficulty of moving that into a broader multilateral environment, into the quadrilateral and an, an advertisement that Alan Beam actually has written some, some very good articles in our strategist blog recently about this, this very issue. Um, Ishikawa-san. Um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Chair, for very kind uh, introduction. And uh, the discussion here is about uh, regional engagement or reality. And in this regard, uh, Japan intends to play a more proactive role to peace and the stability of uh, the region and the rest of the world uh, under the new banner of a proactive contribution to peace. And uh, one of our new engagement in this region is a capacity building assistance uh, in the developing countries. And um, as, a, as Defense White Paper states, uh, uh, the strong presence of the United States is obvious, obviously uh, essential in the region, but uh, it is also very important to promote capacity improvement in the security and uh, defense area of developing countries in the region in order for them to improve their own security environment. I think uh, 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 the uh, capacity building is a very uh, broad idea, but uh, uh, this concept uh, could include uh, uh, three E's, uh, exercises, uh, equipment, and education. And based on this understanding, um, uh, we uh, announced uh, uh, Japan's guiding principle for uh, uh, such cooperation. That is the Shangri-La Dialogue Initiative, which was uh, 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 expressed in the last, uh, last year, and which consists of the following uh, three pillars. The first pillar is a wider promotion of uh, common rules and laws concerning regional air and water. <coughs> and the second pillar is uh, maritime and uh, aerospace uh, security, uh, for example, by en enhancing capabilities for maritime domain awareness and ISR. Also, and the third pillar is uh, improvement of our uh, disaster response capability in the region. And also, uh, as already uh, uh, mentioned by him, uh, Japan is uh, willing to, to promote uh, our bilateral and the trilateral cooperation with Australia and the, and the United States. Last year, uh, we had the uh, 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 two plus two ministerial consultation with uh, Australia in Sydney. And uh, in, at that uh, conference, uh, to, uh, uh, ministers agreed to enhance cooperation in capacity building in, in, in this region. And in case of Japan and the US cooperation, uh, two countries uh, have signed the guideline for Japan-US defense cooperation in last, uh, in last year, and in which uh, both, uh, both countries countries agreed on uh, partner capacity building with objective of, of uh, strengthening, strengthening cap capability of partners in the region to respond to dynamic security e e e challenges. And uh, so taking this opportunity, I would, I would like to explain briefly about uh, our activities uh, in some specific uh, uh, countries in the region. Regarding 
uh, the, uh, 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 our activities in the Asian, uh, ASEAN uh, countries, Southeast Asian countries, I think it is, it is very important uh, uh, to uh, regionally and loot actions based on the international law, including freedom of overflight on the high seas. For this reason, last year, last year we have dispatched Air Self Defense Force personnel to these countries like uh, the Philippines, Vietnam, Malaysia, and Indonesia to give seminar on international aviation law. Um, regarding uh, India, that is another very uh, uh, important uh, economic uh, power. Uh, in last October, uh, the, our Maritime Self Defense Force participated in the uh, Indo US neighbor exercise, Marabar 15. And later on, uh, the two prime ministers uh, from uh, uh, Japan and India agreed on continuous participation of Japan in the, uh, in the Indo US naval exercises uh, on a regular basis. Uh, in, in addition, uh, two countries have been uh, discussing about uh, uh, transferring US-2 amphibian aircraft from Japan to Indian Navy. US-2 US is uh, produced and uh, operated as a store search and rescue aircraft in Japan, and uh, it has a very unique capability as it can land on rough seas with uh, with wave heights over three meters. Uh, and I think if this cooperation comes to reality, we can greatly contribute to improve disaster relief uh, uh, capability of uh, Indian Navy. And uh, also I would uh, like to note that Japan, Australia, and the US uh, cooperating more intensively in promoting capacity of building assistance in the region. For example, last October, uh, Japan and the United States participated in Hali Hamutuk, that is exercise for East Timor, Timor, coordinated by Australia to undertake key infrastructure development projects. In addition, our Maritime Self-Defense Force uh, uh, gave a seminar on underwater medicine in Vietnam this March, and Australia and the United States uh, uh, joined, it, joined the event and gave lectures jointly with Japan. So I think now uh, 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 bilateral and trilateral cooperation is uh, 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 increasingly promoted in the region. And I believe that uh, increased joint engagement in, in, in partner nations uh, enable Japan, Australia, and the US to multi multiply their contribution to regional security. Um, I think uh, in all three countries, Japan, uh, Australia, and the United States, uh, budget, uh, defense-related budget, and uh, uh, human resource uh, uh, limited, so we have to uh, uh, utilize such uh, 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 resources in, uh, uh, in capacity building cooperation uh, 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 as effectively as possible. And uh, I think uh, in, in that uh, uh, context, I think uh, 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 the uh, uh, multi, uh, bilateral and the trilateral cooperation, uh, its uh, importance will be uh, uh, increasingly enhanced. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much, ishikawa san uh, We have around um, 10 and perhaps a little bit more minutes uh, for questions. I would like to ask a first one, and uh, it, it, it's open to all, all panellists because uh, a common theme that we've heard from all is that the countries represented here do work well together bilaterally and multilaterally. So, we have a mechanism here that works. Um, we contrast this to some of, some of the other countries in our region who are more comfortable in uh, bilateral relationships or, or other forms. Uh, I'd like to bring part of this session together with one of the strategic problems that's been discussed a few times, the South China Sea. Uh, 
many of the, the, the claimants or, or those stakeholders who are affected by the South China Sea are members of ASEAN. Uh, ASEAN, of course, has a non-interference uh, approach to life. And a very, uh, one, another very interesting thing that President Yudiono mentioned this morning, of course, was how rare it was for Indonesia to have a relationship of the depth and breadth it has with Australia. Um, given that, how might ASEAN countries respond to increased pressure in the South China Sea? What might we be able to do to help them to move to another place to assist each other? We focus a lot on China. Um, what about uh, those, those other smaller countries who are, are part of our region and, and claimants? Uh, well, Over to... I, I, I get to ask the question, it's wonderful, but they have to... I, I think uh, we need to be very clear-eyed and realistic about what we can and can't expect from ASEAN. Um, I think uh, while the criticism has been made that ASEAN has not uh, come together to deliver a robust response with respect to the South China Sea, it, it's also fair to say that um, ASEAN um, has not been able to be manipulated by um, uh, any of the great powers in terms of the strategic competition in the region. And so that's something we should acknowledge. And we should also acknowledge that while ASEAN will have its limitations, it, it has scored some wonderful successes. Uh, and its role and Indonesia's role in opening up Burma is an outstanding example of that. So um, I think we need to be very realistic about what we can and can't expect ASEAN to do. Uh, and uh, I think that realism means that uh, there are obviously individual states in ASEAN that will have a strong view, but I can't see for the foreseeable future that it will be galvanised as an organisation uh, to counter Chinese claims in the South China Sea. So see our neighbours as they are and what they do well. Right. Yeah. Anyone else like to, to speak to that? Alan? Stu? Um, ASEAN countries are not given to confrontation. And in a funny way, it's our default position. I think it's because we're unsure of ourselves. Um, the South China Sea issue is quite a, quite a tricky issue um, because it is the application of very, very traditional Chinese strategic theory, but this time it's in the east and not in the west. But it is the formation of a buffer, which is traditionally what China has always done. Uh, and from a strategic point of view, I must say, I can understand completely what China's on about. Uh, and equally, I can understand why the ASEAN countries don't want to confront that, because they actually have no power. So what do you do in circumstances when you're confronted by uh, what is on them? Which is, you know, on the margins of being quite aggressive use of power and quasi-militarisation of artificial features, what do you actually do? And it seems to me that you don't respond univocally to that by using power. And I'll tell you why you don't, because you'll never win that. So you are made to look impotent. You'll rattle your sabre and then sail off. I think how you respond to that sort of thing is asymmetrically, which is what actually we're not too bad at. Now, we talk about the strength of our institutions and we talk about the strength of our understanding of the law. So you respond to those things by talking up what rules are and by coalescing everybody around the need to have very clear rules for how you do things. And it seems to me that that is evidently where we should be going. I just want to finesse that just one little bit further, Jacinta, because I want to talk about responding by fly pasts and sail pasts. People in the room might know better than I. Paul Dibb might know. I think we started gateway flights in 1982. Uh, some, anybody from the Air Force can... Uh, I think it was 1982. And... The, we've been doing it ever since. Um, we share gateway information with some regional countries. We've been conducting gateways into the South China Sea since about 1985. So to fly a gateway through the South China Sea is simply 
what we do. We've been doing it legally for 40 years. Why don't we continue to do it? But without saying, we are doing this because you are doing that. I mean, have we no capacity for subtlety? And, and, and I'm not talking about subtlety in bluff. I'm talking about subtlety in the constructive use of ambiguity. And, and that is what diplomacy, in my view, is about. Um, I, I think the military exercises are terrific. They're wonderful. Uh, when I was in defence, we, we initiated new exercises with Japan, for example, built around um, disaster relief. But they're not replicated across the full panoply of relationships between our governments. And there's another good reason for that, because we don't understand each other. I mean, the only way to understand each other is to be able to talk to each other in a language other than English. And so, you know, I think we've got quite profound problems within ASEAN where the... Uh, I'm going to say lingua franca because then I can say the lingua franca is English. Um, but, you know, people talk to each other in English, which is very difficult. Um, I just think we need to invest a hell of a lot more in the ability of people to understand what drives each other, and that is very, very deep cultural sensitivity and cultural appreciation of the kind that we did not see on display here this morning when Bum Bum was here. Close that off in the interest of time and to allow this to open to questions from the floor uh, and ask you just to wait. Yes, uh, if you wouldn't mind waiting until the microphone comes to you. Thank you. If you don't mind just identifying yourself and your organisation. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Andre Siragar. I'm the Indonesian oh, consul from Darwin. And uh, I, I flew exactly here with my anti government friends to listen to the discussion. And praise the Lord, uh, by SBY is here also to give a speech. And uh, I managed to throw in a few points about the Northern Australia and how important Darwin is. But I think um, I really like the discussions today, as you mentioned, the importance of ASEAN. Um, I've been lucky enough to be SBY's interpreter for four years nonstop. And I can witness how the first ASEAN summit, uh, the East Asia summit that took place in Vietnam, really shifted the discussion about how ASEAN should play a role against China. Um, and uh, at this point, um, that was a very significant moment. And what I noticed, despite that, um, uh, I like the comment saying that what can ASEAN countries really, really do? The truth is, um, what SBY was discussing last night at the end of the day, uh, this dynamic equilibrium, although they're not going to be doing as much as some countries expect them to do, their mere presence like poles, which really hinder uh, bigger countries coming in. And, and uh, I think, um, if I may add, uh, as we wait for uh, your discussions, uh, how the US will uh, uh, respond, one thing I can say for a fact is that with this new East Asia Summit, it really, really allows Australia, New Zealand, the US to, to convey their views and be supported by these ASEAN countries. Um, we are actually probably uh, trying to move away from direct bilateral response. I know for a fact that if Vietnam were to go against China or if Philippines were to, work to go against China, it would be very, very difficult. But I think uh, in the coming weeks, uh, we'll be having another multilateral naval cooperation. Uh, I think uh, uh, the general, general might know we have the Komodo exercise, 14th and 16th of, of April, involving China, Japan, Australia, US, UK. And I think that kind of show of show of demonstration of, of force is what the ASEAN way is really about. And, and I think um, by these kind of uh, uh, small demonstrations, we, we will not be able to be as, as powerful as Australia in demonstrating our force, but at least the fact that we're not backing down, uh, I think that is a, an ASEAN way and a very Asian way to tell the Chinese, you may keep on pushing, but like, uh, I, I like Kim Beasley's statement yesterday, we're not moving either. Uh, like the Americans, they're, they're not moving a, away from uh, from, from, from the Chinese, the Americans. I guess my one comment I might ask is, um, I can say that uh, at this point, President Jokowi is getting more and more involved in multilateral affairs. Uh, the recent Palestine uh, event was something that he was very comfortable to engage with. And as uh, my foreign minister uh, slowly makes him more comfortable in uh, reaching out into uh, the region and uh, to, to address ASEAN issues, I foresee that this upcoming summit in, in April and the East Asia Summit in in, uh, in October, I think the stance will be approaching what SBY's uh, ex uh, habits are. And that's where Joko will just say, China, um, uh, I really appreciate your cooperation, but uh, I think uh, it's time that um, we listen to, uh, to how the other countries are feeling. And I'm saying this as the consul in Darwin. 
uh, because uh, we also observe uh, what's happening in Darwin regarding the Chinese presence, the U.S. Uh, uh, presence, and also the Japanese presence in the region. And uh, if I can comment in this forum, is that uh, what happens in October uh, this year, I believe uh, President Jokowi will have a similar stance as he begins to feel comfortable with multilateral issues in 2016. Uh, I'm looking forward to the upcoming East Asia Summit. I guess finally with my small point is that, again, I remind my ambassador, um, how will a, a federal government use or take advantage of the northern part of Australia? Uh, I keep on informing my ambassador, China, Japan are moving into the northern part of Australia, uh, and uh, I'm uh, uh, excited to read your uh, white paper on developing the north and uh, the white paper on defense, but at this point, what I'm telling to my friends in uh, the NT is, it's becoming a race, and, uh, and the Chinese and the Japanese are racing into eastern Indonesia, and right now I see that the Chinese are also becoming more present in North Australia. I think um, I was hoping that the president would add in the idea that as North Australia develops with its defense, I think it's really timely that maybe uh, Australia might start uh, engaging in more uh, practical uh, military cooperation, in which you are, in Indonesia through the Komodo, but um, I believe uh, it'll have to go uh, one step beyond that part, where it's not just merely joint uh, patrols or even uh, three-day naval corporations, but um, perhaps in a way, uh, uh, um, follow up in some discussion, maybe through the Changla Dialogue with uh, Tim Huxley. It, I think it would be a, a very interesting new kind of scenario, so I like Ben Strier's comment regarding this idea of a, a quasi uh, a forum, but not only for Indonesia and Australia, but for ASEAN and Australia. Thank you. If you don't mind, it's in the interest of time. Thank you very much for that contribution, which is very valuable. Uh, we, we might just see if there's one or two very crisp questions. Um, just, just so we can keep to the timetable. Paul Dib, please. Uh, with your indulgence, can I make a crisp comment? Um, Please. And it's about the I have a list of one-liners from our <laughs> panellists. I'll so be many lines. It. It's about yeah. the ASEAN and the ASEAN Regional Forum and Regional Security Architecture. Mm. It's mm. all going nowhere. ASEAN can't make its mind up on the time of day. The last 10 years, on behalf of foreign affairs, I've represented Australia at a particular meeting of the ASEAN Regional Forum, 27 countries discussing preventive diplomacy and confidence building. We have agreed on nothing. And the problem is, is when ASEAN is in the driver's seat, or if I might say so, as the back seat driver, saying no all the time, we have not just consensus, but it's got to be unanimous agreement at a pace comfortable to all, meaning at a pace comfortable to the slowest. And it is an enormously frustrating process. Um, I can see Alan Beam uh, looking at me. Alan, I've probably reached the end of my well-known patience at these meetings. It is a ponderous exercise. It is going nowhere. It is agreeing on nothing. I've tried to get an agreement on a paper, a study, on avoidance of maritime incidents. Can get no agreement. So what happens if China really leans and continues to lean on Southeast Asia, ASEAN, in the South China Sea, and effectively creates, if you'll pardon me using a very old Cold War phrase, a sphere of influence? That has direct security influence, interest for us, because Southeast Asia is our secure northern approaches. Would anyone like to comment on that, or will we take that as a... Take it as a comment. I think, and I would think that that was um, a, a point well raised, but probably one that was, was addressed by Alan and Dad. I just say that what Kim Beasley lacks in passion, Paul is more than endowed with impatience. <laughs> <laughs> yes, any, any additional questions? If I can see. Look, that, that brings us to the conclusion of an, of an extraordinary discussion. Uh, I'll, I'll note, I, I, if we could stay here for another couple of days, drilling down in further, we had climate change, oceans policy, Antarctica, the South Pacific. We didn't even get to what happens if Noumea, as well as Bougainville, uh, uh, votes for independence in the next two years and, and, and France potentially withdraws from the region. Uh, we've also spoke... Uh, um, Ishikawa-san spoke about that importance of sea air rescue and capacity building. General Rudder also spoke about HADR. These areas where, we, where there isn't confrontation and where we do work together and where defence agencies do work together helpfully, these are very important foundation building, building bricks. Uh, look, thank you very much for, for your, your comments and, and uh, I would like you to join me in thanking our expert panel this afternoon.